Jen Howie, welcome back. Thanks, Trevor Windsor. <laughs> okay, don't be weird about it. <laughs> I was like excited to have Jen, and then now I'm not. Well, this honestly, so I was great. just focused on saying it right because sometimes when when I say Windsor, you get all uh, over me, and you're like, "Don't do that." So I was. I'll be honest. I cannot remember a single time where you've said my last name like that because we probably wouldn't be friends. Um, yeah, yeah don't, here we are. Yeah. Okay. All right. Weird start. Okay. This so we can start to over. A boring start. <laughs> here we go. All right. So um, we are in week two of our Tools for Betrayal series. We're talking about the tools betrayed spouses can and should use in their healing journey. And today we're going to talk about it's really one tool that's like two tools it's commitment to change and double bind. Yes. So, uh, Jen, from your experience, just let's recap people what is a commitment to change and what is a double bind? Okay, so a double bind is a difficult place uh, where you find yourself in a lose-lose situation. So it's where you feel like you just can't win. And then a commitment to change is where you're really looking at where you overfunction or where you underfunction, and then you move towards making a healthier uh, choice for yourself. Um, and also commitment change always involves an emotional cost of yeah. some sort. Yeah, or a double bind. Right. Yeah. Like around. Yeah. What, and to break yes. it down, the commitment to change is saying, how can I break down this big uh, iceberg of a thing I'm working on, whether yeah. it's restoring my marriage, right. working on getting through betrayal trauma, learning to trust again. I mean, those yeah. feel like yes. really big things that take a long time. Yeah. So how do I work on it? Well, that's what a commitment to change can function as to mm-hmm. say, okay, this week what I need to do is you know, not lose my temper with my kids or right. practice better eating habits right. or work on expressing my feelings better mm-hmm. when I'm talking to my spouse, whatever it is, like breaking it down a week at a time. And the double bind is probably the tool we get the most questions about. People yep. say they, they yep. don't understand it. And um, one of the things I realized I think that people miss is in the double bind, you have probably chosen one of your two options. Yes, yes. The double bind is just to um, to see what the other option could have been. Right. So for example, if we're procrastinating and procrastination leads to heightened anxiety and pressure at work, maybe that's what we chose. But the other side of the double bind, <laughs> there's some piece of silver there. Uh, <laughs> Why is the, there a spoon on the stir table? my hot chocolate. The other, maybe the other side of the double bind would be, I have to face a hard project where I might fear failure yeah. or not know how to do yeah. it. That's the yeah. other side. So maybe I chose the procrastination route. Um, So it doesn't mean there's two things you're choosing between currently. It may be looking back and going, when I made a poor choice this week, why didn't I make the other choice? What was my other option? And to see how the two things were both difficult and why we maybe chose the easy way out versus doing something harder. And I think that that's true for like across the board in any arena or domain of life, we're always facing double binds. And so it doesn't have to be like life shattering, earth altering, all of this stuff. It could just be there is a decision on either end that's going to cost me something, yes. and that would make me not want to necessarily make that decision or that direction. Yeah. Both both include a fear. You're dealing mm-hmm. with a fear yeah. of something, yeah. and so identifying what that is and choosing which fear to move toward and wrestle yes. with and work out. Ooh, yeah. Um, yeah, as a part of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as we're focusing on these tools for the betrayed spouse, we've done – quite a few podcasts that talk about those that are struggling Mm and uh, how you would use it as part of a group like Seven Pillars or Unraveled for Women. But what about on that side of the betrayed spouse who's in Betrayal and Beyond or maybe Hope for Men, and they're feeling like, well, this it's really not my problem that needs to change. I'm just the the innocent bystander that got hurt by your addiction. What would it look like for that spouse to make a commitment to change and to identify double binds in their life? Could you give some examples of what betrayed spouses might identify as their commitments and their double binds? Sure. Initially, a, commi- a commitment t- to change can be something something as simple as learning how to give thanks for the circumstances that you're even currently in, mm-hmm. right? So, I mean, that's that's a godly principle that he gives us to give thanks, to be grateful in all things, you know? So working through giving thanks, I think giving thanks um, is often an antidote to contempt, or pain. Yeah. So that's a piece that you could simply do from the very beginning if you're in the beginning phases and haven't done some of the deeper dives, you know, um, rehearsing the promises that God's given you. Um, mm. When we don't, when we feel like promises have been broken, remember the promises that God has given to us. So rehearsing things like that. And then, of course, calling your support people is a great place to start. And then, yeah. um, and then, of course, working out 
the double bind that yeah. we're here actually talking about today. Right. You know, those are some good places to start with commitment to change. Yeah. For me, the double bind piece, the way, what that looked like and still does to this day is telling my husband um, one of the double binds I had and still have is that uh, choosing how to communicate to him the pain I experience when when he acts or doesn't act a certain way. This is a mm -hmm. huge one. This is a lot yeah. of women actually yeah. really, really wrestle with this. Um, like, so I want to tell my husband um, that what the painful outcome of, of what he does, how that, how that affects me, mm -hmm. but I risk driving him deeper into shame. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. um, then I'm afraid that he's gonna maybe, uh, maybe relapse or, yeah. or walk or move towards a coping mechanism that mm -hmm. isn't necessarily healthy. So now I'm in this double bind. Like, do I, do I tell him how I'm ex the pain I'm experiencing yeah. that could have that consequence? Or if I don't say something, then I'm at risk for not being fully known. And I, and I want to be seen. Yeah. I want to be heard. I want to be fully known. Yeah. I, I want him to, um, have empathy for, yeah. for where I am and where I'm coming from. So now in this double bind, it's like, do I tell him what I'm experiencing or do I not? Because there's a, there's essentially a risk mm -hmm. and a fear yep. and emotion and all those things that I have to wrestle with. So those have looked, that's kind of what it looked like in the beginning for, for Dan and I, mm -hmm. uh, when, when working out, uh, the difference between a commitment to change and a double bind. And then that shifts a little bit more yeah. when you get into the work, I think in, in, uh, betrayal and beyond that probably doesn't come until uh, chapter seven yeah. or so. Yeah. So it's a while before we get into that, and that looks a little bit different later on. Yeah, and I'm thinking too um, for the betrayed spouses that might be listening that are early on, or maybe even um, are not in group or thinking about group for the first time. Even joining a group for betrayal trauma is a double bind, right? Yes, oh, yeah. yes. absolutely. Right. The, even the fact, because on one end, it's like I could just sit in this and and not have anything that might bring about that health or uh, that stability or help um, help me normalize my situation or understand what's going on. But then on the other end, it's like, well, I didn't do this and I have to go through yes. Because we hear that all the time. We do. Is why, why do I need group? Why do I need to go in and get my own healing? Because that will bring work, <laughs> ton, a ton of work. Um, and what's interesting is when we step into group, there's also that risk of like, I'm going to realize there are things about me that are not okay. And that I need to work on and that, and it, it could be a, a number of things. It could be, you have your own numbing agents that you use. Um, it could be maybe codependency as a part of your life. It could be victim mindset. I mean, there's so many different things that can come from that. And that's fearful too, even though it's good, it still is really scary because I know I'm going to have to feel that stuff in order to change it. So even uh, coming to the idea of joining a betrayal group is a double bind by itself. Yeah. Well, and it's, it's seeing what my options are yeah. and what's the best possible outcome of making the right choice or the healthier choice. Yeah. Uh, if, if people listen to the previous episode on the faster scale, they'll know that the double bind and the commitment to change really are meant to come out of that faster scale. So if you didn't listen to that, that episode, go, go back, back real quick, yes. catch up. Um, because as we identify what our relapse is or the, the relapses that we're most aware of, even if we're the betrayed spouse, that connects then to our commitment to change because a commitment to change is really meant to be what's the primary thing you need to do this week to avoid relapse, to avoid going back to that place. So if you're the betrayed spouse and your relapse is exploding at your kids in anger yeah. or you know binge eating while all the kids are at school or yeah. you know overspending on Amazon because you just make all these impulse purchases like whatever it is if you see that's unhealthy I don't want to go back there but this week I might be tempted to so what commitment do I need to make to not reenact that that yeah. relapse or yeah. what's my most common relapse so right. when you can actually connect it to things you're also trying to change because that's the value if if your spouse is in group that's what's valuable for them too, is that we're not just making random, oh, I'd, I'd like to be healthier in this way this week. I mean, mm -hmm. a commitment to change can work for that, yeah. but that's not really going to connect to the deep transformation we want to make. The yeah. transformation is related to our recovery journey. Right. So if, if, if I could say like for my wife's example, I know her relapse would probably have been something as basic as she shuts down. That's her response to trauma is just yeah. like avoidance. And mm -hmm. I'm just not going to think about it. I'm going to move on and live my life. Mm -hmm. Well, that would keep her from healing. It would keep us from talking. We wouldn't be able to connect. So she may have to choose a commitment to change as simple as I'm going to do my homework this week. Because for her, that was 
a choice to face the pain, yep. Yep. a choice to lean into the trauma that I had caused and the fear. And so the way those work together for her, though, I, I think was helpful to see that here's my temptation. Here's my go-to to avoid yeah. all this. Yeah. So here's what I'll need to do instead. And when you can begin to see that connection, that's where I think the tools really become powerful in working together. Yeah. yeah. So uh, when it comes to commitment to change and double bind, how does that relate to the phone calls that we make, right? We talk about this. We've had a lot of episodes. We've had a lot of conversations around the importance of phone calls in group. So of a, a betrayed spouse making phone calls, how do the, the commitment to change and the double bind relate to those phone calls? You know, a lot of women um, really get frustrated <laughs> with having to make phone calls like well why do I need to do it I'm <laughs> yeah. not the one that really needs to be held accountable for anything and right. I, it's not so much about accountability but really more about um, stepping out of isolation and into community That's good. Um, stepping out of unhealthy thinking and surrounding ourselves with others who help us heal and um, you know when we process with others we process differently and especially when we process um, yeah. out loud um, you know, we need people in our lives who are going to speak truth to us. And it's through those truth tellers that we really realize how far we've come okay. and really, um, are reminded about where we're going. Mm -hmm. So those phone calls aren't, they're not a punishment. They're not meant to be a punishment. They're meant right. to be kind of a lifesaver and mm -hmm. a, um, what's that thing when you throw out to people when they're in the water and they're drowning? A life preserver. Life preserver. That's the word. So they, is that what, is that, is that <laughs> what it's <laughs> called? Yeah. Oh, usually yeah. life and raft I win? preserver. What? Oh, just kidding. Okay. I'm thinking specifically of those round things that I don't know that I've ever even seen anyone ever use. Okay. Probably because I've never <laughs> been in the situation to see that. But okay. <laughs> not in that situation. But in a in a uh, betrayal and beyond situation, most definitely. You know, those are the things that we that we throw out to each other, and phone calls can really, really yeah. be that lifeline that we need mm -hmm. to remember and um, to be challenged, um, and also to experience quite a bit of hope in moving forward. So that's why we make the phone calls. Yeah. It's really to be in community with yeah. others because Christ has created us to heal in community. Totally. Yeah, I really appreciate the way you brought in that word isolation, because I think that is yeah. um, the enemy's tactic, whether you are the betrayed or the addict, that yeah. that isolation, the shame that can build, the sense of being alone, that's just where the enemy does his work and where our old self can beat us up. But when we break isolation through a phone call, we, we enter into truth, we enter into light, we enter into grace. And so it, at times it may be uh, being selective about who we call, that the person mm -hmm. we call is that kind of truth yeah. teller, grace giver, yes. affirming. And if you find someone you're calling is just, they're so stuck that calling them just breeds more negativity, you know, it's okay to be selective about who you choose yeah. to call because that's a reminder too. The phone calls are for you and for you to process yeah. and face your day, not to check in or check up right. on them. And yeah. so make sure you're yep. calling people that do that for you. That, yeah. that when you call, you feel like, man, I just, I broke out of that place I was in, that, yep. that I was listening to some shame or some lies about my worth, value, and identity, believing that yeah. my spouse's struggle means I am something. Yeah. And yeah. Um, yeah, just I think breaking isolation is such a key thought and term that I wanted to really emphasize that. Yeah. yeah. And those phone calls, when, when you're talking about your commitment to change, it's something that you've identified that you want to change yeah. in order for your health to progress. And so it's not something like you're saying that someone's checking in. It's almost like I'm calling to report like, hey, here's how I'm doing. And with the double bind, I'm going through Genesis process right now. Michael Dye in that talks about living in health is a consistently, uh, it's being consistent in addressing the double binds in your life. That's how you live in health. And so I think that that is important for a, bet a betrayed spouse and a struggling spouse, that we have to identify those double binds and then address them. We can't just let them go untouched. And I think that when you invite, and this is what I've experienced, when you invite someone in to your inner world, to what's going on, uh, if they love you and care about you, they don't want you to stay there. Right. They want to help you progress and help you move. And so if I'm sharing a double bind and someone can hear the tension that I'm struggling with, they want to help me. So they'll ask questions yes. or they'll share their experience. Mm -hmm. You know, the the friends who like know the process a little bit more won't teach or tell me what yeah. to do, but yeah. will help me kind of find that avenue of where health is for me. Yeah. Actually, yeah. I was going to touch in on that too. I Reach out to your good question askers. Yes. Because um, those are the ones that are yes. probably going to bring the most value uh, to yep. to the healing process. So the people who ask you the 
and reach out to your tough question askers. Yeah, those the ones people. that make you slightly uncomfortable. Yeah, and make you dig a like, little bit shut deeper. Shut up! I don't <laughs> want to. Like, if you want to stay in isolation and unhealth, don't call those people. Right. Right. right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 So it can be easy to see why our spouse needs to change if they're the ones struggling, yeah. if they've been an addict. But when it comes to like me changing, that can be more of a question like, whoa, whoa, it's not my issue that we got into this. So if I'm not the addict, why would a betrayed spouse make a commitment to change? Talk a little bit about that. Oh my goodness. Because the addict isn't the only person who's being transformed. Mm. We are too. You Say know? that again. Say that again. That's good. The addict is not the only person who is being transformed. Mm -hmm. We are in, we are being transformed in this process. And quite honestly, when we enter into that, it can actually be quite empowering. So when we are in a in a, in a space where we don't get to choose our circumstances. We didn't bring yeah. ourselves here, but when we enter into a commitment to change, we now have the authority to speak into our own lives and make changes that benefit us, changes that help me become the best version of myself. Mm -hmm. So to me, um, rather than looking at a commitment to change, again, as, as, a, as a negative, something that has to be changed because I'm faulty in this area, yeah. we can look at a commitment to change as something that empowers us to do something with a set of circumstances that we otherwise did not necessarily have um, control over. Yeah. So it yeah. helps me, you know, um, live my life off of my values rather than my emotions yeah. because I am committing to identifying the things that keep me from from living out that healthier version of myself. Yeah. Um, what's coming to mind right now is just that, like, maybe you're in the situation where your spouse is addicted to porn or has had affairs or they they have betrayed you and you're feeling that trauma. Um, it may be on different levels, but you're going to experience betrayal at another point in your life. And so I think that there is this element of the future of your life and your yeah. relationships, whether it's this marriage, if it's restored or not, or any other relationship outside yes. of that. Like these are these are tools and this is a process that will help you be able to manage those feelings better. Um, and again, even as I say that, I can hear someone who's in this season just like, well, it's not about me. It's not my health. Like I'm not here. Yes, you're right. But if we don't work on this stuff, if we don't find healing here, this stuff's going to stick around. It's like, a, you know, and I, I, f I think about this a lot, that the wounds that we have, if they don't go addressed, if you don't treat the wound and dress the wound, then uh, you're just going to walk around and it's going to get bumped into by everything in your life. Yes. And it's going to impact so much more than just this one relationship. Yeah. So I, I hope I hope the listener is hearing me. I'm trying to just say that there are things that are far reaching in importance outside of this current context that these tools can help you manage the betrayals of life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you've used the illustration, Trevor, of the car accident, yes. that if, if we have been through betrayal because of our spouse, it's a traumatic event that we were both involved in and yep. we weren't the driver right. and it wasn't our fault, yep. but we may have gotten hurt. Mm -hmm. We may have trust issues anger issues, wounds, places that, like you said, are unhealed. And if if our spouse goes through physical therapy and gets yeah. healthy after that accident, we're like, well, the accident wasn't my fault, so I'm not going to get better. You know, right. now we've got forever a limp or things that are, yep. are just haven't been yep. treated. So just because it's not your fault doesn't mean it didn't create issues yeah. that you're going to need to recover from. And part of that recovery is looking at, okay, what do I need to work on this week? What yeah. could I break down? And maybe it's something as simple, and I, I don't mean to say that gratitude is easy, but but a, that's a simple commitment that you brought up, Jen, to say, I'm j this week, I'm just going to look every day to say, how could I find gratitude and thankfulness for my situation? Because that's a perspective shift that long-term can make a huge yeah. difference. So it's, it's just a willingness to say, I want to be a healthy, growing person, yeah. and that means I've got steps to take. Yeah. Whether it's my fault or not really doesn't impact the, the reality that I have steps to take. Yeah. Right. I, even as you said that, and I, Jane, I know you said this, that being grateful for your situation, maybe you're not grateful for your situation, but you're grateful for one thing in your life. Yeah. Like, I think there's there can be a difference that my current context, life could be bad on a number of places, you know, but even something is like, I'm grateful I have a car that can drive me to work every day. I'm, I'm grateful for gas money. I'm grateful for coffee. Praise Jesus for coffee. Like, it could be anything <laughs> like that. Um, so I just, I think it's okay to make that distinction. I think we simplify yeah. gratitude way too much hmm. and underestimate the power that it has. Yeah. I know. Conviction as I'm listening Me to too. this, I'm even more grateful. <laughs> Me too. Um, okay. So 
we talked about this in the last episode as well with sharing the faster scale, but if we've got a commitment to change as a betrayed spouse, that potentially could be awkward or uncomfortable for both spouses if it's shared. Mm -hmm. Um, And so should we share it and, and how do we go about that with our struggling spouse? Well, I think it depends on the spouse and how safe your spouse is, emotionally safe that person is. Mm. Because the commitment to change, again, you know, is something that we're working towards personally. In my relationship with Dan, um, yeah, we share with each other. But because we value being fully known by one another. Yeah. But also, all of that being said, he, um, we don't, we're not each other's accountability person. So when we share our commitment to change, it's about simply being known yeah. And we don't get to comment on each other's commitment right, to change. We don't get to right. police it. Yeah. We don't get to check yeah. in on it. We we bring it to one another because it's an effort and a step towards moving towards vulnerability and transparency and intimacy mm-hmm. with one another. Mm-hmm. So, um, but he's also stated that that when I when especially in the beginning, that when I was um, committing to changing myself, hmm. it really gave him the sense that he wasn't alone in a healing process, that he wasn't the only one that had stuff to do. Now, keep in mind, when we entered this process, I truly felt like he was the only one that had stuff to do because he's the Mm -hmm. only one who had cheated. So clearly, he was the only one that had work to do. Yeah. And um, as the Lord worked on my heart and started to reveal to me some some things that needed to be changed in my own life, not just in relationship to my husband and mm-hmm. to relationship to Christ himself and to how I relate to others, I've learned that there's there was plenty of growth that God wanted to do in me, and I wanted him to do that in me as well. So I shared mm-hmm. that with Dan, um, and as a result, it ended up really becoming a connecting point where we got to see into each other's inner lives, into our inner thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. And um, it's I really feel like it's where true intimacy started to begin mm. between he and I. Yeah, I, I think every relationship is different too. And so Agreed. you have to analyze where you're at. Um, if part of the issues that your spouse is recovering from is being very controlling, mm-hmm. narcissistic, manipulative, Sharing a commitment to change could be a, an unhealthy or unwise yeah. thing to do yeah. because it sure almost can. gives them a way to right. use that to their advantage. And it, so if you have any fears like that, and I'm, I'm not saying wait till your spouse is perfect before you share a commitment to change, but right. to just be aware of where you're at in your relationship, what kind of communication you have with one another, because there are relationships where I think it can go really well. Mm-hmm. That if you want to share that commitment, yeah. I know both my wife and I have had times where we've said something like, hey, this week my commitment is about spending quality time with the kids. And so if you see me spending time on my phone when I could be with the kids who are in the same room, I'm asking you to just, you know, say this phrase or mention something. Now, I've invited them to do that. So I think that might be the important thing is if you realize, hey, here's one that's, it's not necessarily about my spouse. I'm not making them my accountability partner. But I can invite their help. Yes. You've given your spouse permission. Now you have to be careful then if they follow up on that, you don't get irritated at them. (laughs) Right. But I think that is, back to the word you used, empowering when couples Mm -hmm. can say to each other, here's what I'm working on, here's why, and here's how I think you can help. Here's how you could support me, encourage me. Yeah. Because we, by nature, want to help and support our spouse. And when we're given a practical, tangible way how to do that, I think even the struggling spouse can respond well to it, like you said about Dan, like, yeah, yeah, that'd be great. I really appreciate what you're yeah. doing. And then it motivates them mm-hmm. to do some of their work as well. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, if you know the double binds that people are facing and they're sharing that, your ability to minister to them becomes exponential. Like if I don't know what's going on, I don't know what struggle you're facing or tension you're facing, um, then I mean, I don't exactly know what's going on. Like I'm just addressing what's going on like outside, what I can see, how you're acting, you know, the expressions that you're making. But if you're able to share that double bind and the commitment to change that's tied to it, Mm -hmm. my ability to number one, be empathetic to you increases. Uh, And that doesn't mean that it's your job to help me be empathetic. I'm just saying that if you share what's going on, I know a lot more and can then act on what I know. And I mean, because what you were saying, I think of, The example, I want to spend more time. Like if my wife came to me and said, I want to spend more time with the kids, then maybe I'm the one who makes dinner or cleans up after or, you know, does anything around the house to clear up the space. Um, We went through that study, Vertical Marriage, and I know it was talking about sex, but the idea of helping carry some of the suitcases, specifically that women, they have all these suitcases Mm -hmm. where men just carry one bag the whole time. (laughs) And so it's that idea of how can I take some of the suitcases off your plate so that you can do 
what it is that you you want to do or make uh, makes you a healthier version of yourself. So I think that it helps me as even a struggling spouse or a supporting spouse be able to be more empathetic and then find creative ways to help you get to that point. Yeah, I think I think you guys hit the nail on the head. You, you're making a plan. Um, there are parameters around it. But the cool thing about what you're saying also is that it's my commitment to change. So I set the parameter. I share that parameter. I give you verbiage on how to speak back to me. And when... Mm-hmm when I've given you permission to speak into it, you right. know, I've, I, I'm telling you, um, when I, when I do this, this is, this is the phrase I need to hear. So it's really mm-hmm. the only thing you're, what you're doing is you're inviting someone into something, but because you're giving them safe parameters, it allows them to speak into it. Cause you know, this doesn't work super well. Like I've had a lot of, uh, health goals <laughs> and, especially when it comes to food and I've given Dan to s- permission to speak into it. And I even gave him the words to speak into it. And yeah, he said, Jen, stop it. Like, <laughs> right. right? That... Do you really want to put that, you know, <laughs> oh, do you really, do you God. really want to eat that? You know? And I'm are just you like, sure. Are, yeah. And yeah. that's, I <laughs> learned very quickly that I didn't like that. And yeah. so you have to sometimes, <laughs> uh, re, uh, you know, change things around right. a little bit. Because then he's like, "You told me to say these <laughs> words, and now you're okay. upset at me for saying these words." Exactly. Right. Right. And yeah. so, so you know, there has to be there has to be room for flexibility and yeah. not getting it getting it right. And there has to be uh, rules around, or you know, um, conversations around. Okay, well, when we don't execute this really well, how do right. we how do we handle that? Yeah. Because I did give him permission, and then I got all wounded <laughs> when when after I gave him permission yeah. and it decided that. Um, yeah, maybe I should approach this a little bit differently next yeah. time. It's all a learning process. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. good. Yeah, it is. And I, I think remembering whose commitment to change it is yes. that for the spouse, <laughs> like, well, hey, if that's their commitment, it's not my job to badger them about it, ask yeah. them about it. Like mm-hmm. in a commitment to change, it's my job to come to you when I want help. It's my yeah. job to bring it up to you that's when good. I'm, you know, needing input. So yeah. Yeah. if you keep that in mind, that helps. Uh, we, we kind of alluded to this a little bit already, Jen, but how do all of these tools kind of work together in terms of the betrayed spouse using the commitment to change, a faster scale, phone calls? It's like even maybe some spouses listening right now, it's like, boy, it just it feels like a lot of work. So hmm. what is the purpose and the benefit of all this for the betrayed spouse? It is a lot of work, but it's worth it. It's work that's yeah. worth it. Um, well, you know, this, the whole point of really of all this really is to have awareness you know, if if there's one thing I can control in my life, it's how I respond to something. Mm-hmm. And uh, being aware is really how how we do that. And so mm-hmm. um, I want to approach my life by responding and not reacting. So um, when I do that, I go back to what I said before, that now I'm living my life based on my values, mm-hmm. right? When I can respond to something rather than react, I can... I can make decisions based on the things yeah. that I value and respond to those. Otherwise, I'm living off my emotions, and that's where my reactions come in. So yeah. really, the faster scale is about awareness. Um, the double bind, also awareness. The commitment mm-hmm. to change is keeping a cognitive awareness of, yeah. the, of, of the changes we do want to make. So if yeah. we really want to – if we want to live life – responding rather than reacting awareness yeah. is absolutely 100 yeah. percent the you know the best way to do that it's mm-hmm. and um each of those each of these tools keeps us in that awareness yeah and i think anybody who uses these tools it trains you to tie your behaviors yeah. to the feelings the thoughts the beliefs about yourself um and to understand that, and because we talked about this the last episode too, is that just because you made it all the way to exhausted on the faster scale doesn't mean you had a worse week than someone who's in forgetting priorities. It just means life happens. And so I think it helps us see ourselves on the scale that uh, life just moves and flows and it has this rhythm. Um, But it also helps me in that rhythm to identify, okay, when I feel this way, this is what I. This is the double bind I tend to experience because of this situation, yeah. and in that double bind, I tend to choose this. I want to change that, and so what I can do is I can back up, look at that experience. Okay, what is it in that experience that's causing this double bind? So for me, I'm actually going to the source of everything, yeah. rather than just like, okay, well, I just need to do something different. It's like, well, yes, but like, let's make sure that that thing that you're doing is different. That commitment to change is connected to the double bind you're actually facing, which then is addressing the actual wound or problem that you have. And so I think that it trains our brain to think that way. Yeah. 
Yeah, I was thinking about how all these work together. And to me, it's staying actively engaged mm-hmm. in our own recovery. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Because re- recovery, yeah. Is, as you said, it's not easy and it's a process. Yeah. But we can make it a much, much longer process by ignoring it for a few weeks and then coming back to something right. and relearning again and going, yeah. oh, yeah, I can't do that. That's not help- helpful for me. Or, And then we're just kind of going through the motions a lot and not really moving forward. So mm-hmm. I think, though, when we get into these weekly rhythms, they really can become sustainable change. Mm-hmm. And it's a yeah. little bit the difference between like saying, well, my goal for 2021 is to lose 10 pounds versus someone who joins Weight Watchers. Now, I'm not trying to make an ad for Weight Watchers, but I know in that program, there's weekly weigh-ins, yeah. there's the food you can buy, there's group meeting, like there's right. a whole system mm-hmm. that they engage people in that leads to their change. Now, the, the downfall I would see is that once you're out of their system, you can revert right back to your old ways because they didn't yeah. become your normal. Right. This to me is these tools that keep you engaged and they become your normal of just analyzing each week. Where am I at? What's yep. my low moment? Yep. And then when I see where that is, what am I working on? Yep. How am I making it better? Yep. And who can I connect with? Who can I engage with? That That's just staying engaged in my own recovery. And that can become a normal for yep. the course of your life and right. not just be well for a few months. I really focused on it and then I kind of lost track and I'm yeah. back where I started. It doesn't have to be the season of life. You're like, man, that was awesome. You remember that? Mm-hmm. It's like, you don't, it can be your current the whole time, believe it or not. Uh, which even as I say that takes a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> you even said these tools take a lot of work. It does. But as Nick said, it becomes a rhythm and almost becomes a second nature the more that you do yeah, it. Yeah, you have you kind of create sort of a muscle memory, a yeah. mental muscle memory yeah. by using these That's tools. Good. And and you, you become stronger and mm-hmm. faster and more yeah. accurate with them. And right. so then it becomes something that it's almost hard not to do life. Right. Almost not hard. It's almost hard to do life without them because, yeah. because they've yeah. become um, such a great way to move mm-hmm. past – um, the things that are getting us stuck, right? Right. And then your community starts to use it. And then yes. you're just in a culture all the yes. time. I mean, we work at Pure Desire. This is literally the culture we live in. Huh. You How know many what I times mean? do I come into your office and saying, <laughs> I I have a belief system here. Yeah. This is where I'm at. This. Tell me what's like, tell me where I'm wrong in my thinking. Here's right. where, yeah. yeah. And that then becomes something where when we know that we're not using these tools or our recovery isn't as active or I don't feel as locked in as I, I want to be, then I can just go over to the person who's in my community and say, hey, this is where I'm at. Help me. Mm-hmm. And they can be like, oh yeah, well you remember. And then shared language and experience then becomes a thing that helps us all. Which builds trust. Uh, totally. Mm-hmm. And health. <laughs> And I'm just kidding. Okay, so um, <laughs> what if, and this is a really good question for anybody in group, um, but for a betrayed spouse, they set a commitment to change, uh, they share it with their group, they've invited them in to help, you know, as help facilitate this as you go. What if we don't succeed at that week's commitment to change? Quit. Yeah. Throw in the towel. <laughs> raise your hands. All or none. Commitment Here. to never change. Black and white thinking. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Um, I, I think we have to be careful to not go too black and white. Um, but it's not a grading system. It That's isn't. Just like, it's a learning system. Yeah. So if you've learned something from it, that is so value. That is so mm. valuable. Yeah. Um. So just like with any mistake that we make or or failing that we have, am I learning something about what I believe? Am I learning something about um? how I'm wired and, and what I think? Am I learning something about how I relate to others? There's a lot to learn when um, my current commitment to change um, isn't as effective as I'd hoped it would have been. Yeah. It could be simply that um, I put unrealistic expectations mm-hmm. and I need to break down th- my, um, my you know, the just break it down differently yeah. and, and put out realistic goals Right. For those uh, commitments to change. Yeah, I think sometimes we learn as much from a commitment that we aren't able to keep mm-hmm. as the ones we do. Yeah. Because you you have the opportunity to sit back and analyze, why didn't this work for me? Yeah. What what was it? Yeah. Maybe we didn't um, recognize uh, an emotion we were going to have to face, a fear of talking to someone or sure. a fear of doing something new. Yeah. Maybe we weren't specific enough about yeah. when we were going to accomplish the task yeah. or the goal. Or maybe we were too specific that we said yes. it, it's going to happen only at this time and we didn't have the flexibility to put it somewhere else. Like there's yeah. just a lot of things we can look into and go, oh, okay, this this actually I learned something. Like you're saying, Jen, I learned something new about myself. Yeah. 
and why I didn't. And that's the goal, I right. think, is to learn and grow and continue yep. in recovery, yep. not to just have these, you know, check marks yes. of every week. Oh, did it, did it, did yep. it. Because that's just can become a performance mentality yep. of right. I'm going to perform my way into hell. <laughs> right. No, we're, it's about learning and growing. Yep. And that is that is going to be, by nature, it involves hits and misses. That's mm -hmm. how we learn and grow and recover. Yeah. And uh, like two words, tweak it. Like that's... Maybe you didn't do it this week. Tweak it. I mean, mm -hmm. just make a, a small change. And maybe, you know, as you're talking about, maybe instead of trying to do your commitment to change at one specific time, just say, in this window, I'm going to do it. Or, I mean, you can come up with plenty of them, but just tweak it. And uh, and I think one of the things, too, because I'm thinking about our first episode with Bob Vandermeer. It was episode five. I'll just, I remember wow. it. Um, because he said, damned if you do and damned if you don't. Um, because that's what a double bind is. But yeah. um, he talked about the idea of of that realistic where if I've never woken up at 5 a.m. and I want to read my Bible this week, don't say I want to get up at 5 a.m. and read my Bible. Like he's like, don't do that. Right. And it's so true because we need to look at our daily rhythms and fit our commitment to change into that. So yes. for me, when I first started group, I, do, I and I still don't feel like I have a lot of time to make phone calls. So I make phone calls when I'm in the car and I have a headset, everyone, calm yeah. down. Like, <laughs> right? Yeah. But I, I do it. I take advantage of the time in my schedule that I have, and I just repurpose that for my own health. And so maybe that's what it is. Maybe you're just um, not looking at where this can already fit into our current schedule. And so I think that that's one thing. If you're not successful, maybe just look for another window or another perspective on how this could fit into my rhythm. Yeah, we just recently did, you know, it's, January. No, we're in February now. It's close this enough. This is coming out in March. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> yeah. back we're in cutting January. This whole part, right? right? Back in January, Dan and I um, set set up some health goals, some spiritual goals, and all these different goals and non drinking goals. We did non drinking goals. Yes. yes. <laughs> and um, dry January. You've never heard of this, Nick? Yeah. Apparently, next January <laughs> okay. wasn't dry. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Didn't know that was a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't know it needed to be a thing. Yeah, and I've just made this a thing. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, Dan and I had set some goals to increase our exercise goals, and we shared we we um, shared our commitment to change with Nick for um, for the month of February. So the goal mm. was set in January. We, February comes around. Our goal is to improve on our mile. So we've we've given Nick permission to speak to the professional. Runner. I don't know if right. they gave me permission. I just like running, so I was curious. <laughs> Yeah, made me interested. We invited you into the conversation, yes, and and so Dan and I um, did our first day in February, and and our our miles were um, much longer than we anticipated them to be. And full transparency, full transparency. <laughs> and Nick says, "So how is it going?" Dan and I have not got back on the treadmill since we set that initial mile, and and so mm. here we are now with this commitment to change, and 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 thinking it was going to be a great thing, and we'll be good because Nick will hold us, not hold us accountable, but Nick will at least ask about right. it. So sure. we've told someone. And so uh, Nick comes in the office today. So how, how is that going? You know, you big, do big gulp and you're like, yeah. oh, crap. Right. And so what Dan and I are realizing is that we, um, th actually through our conversation with Nick asking right questions, is that we need to break down specifically how we're going to execute it. That's good. And we, yeah. we hadn't done that. We just set this arbitrary goal right. with no real, you know, strategy. Right. I'm going to run a marathon. Okay. okay. Great. How are you going to get there? Yeah. 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 And so we realized today that we have to, there are some daily commitments that we need to make and at the very minimum, weekly commitments we need to make through the mm -hmm. month of February to really, um, to execute that commitment mm -hmm. to change. Yeah. And this is where community is so good for one another. Mm -hmm. And then reaching out to those, um, who enjoy actually talking about it was very helpful too. <laughs> Which is why they're not talking to me about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's important to recognize we can all do that with our commitment to change. They're, they're just basically aspirational goals. Yep. Get closer to God. Um, yeah. Be a less angry person. Uh, engage more with my spouse. I mean, all great, yeah, great things. Right. But like, yeah. mm -hmm. what will you do? How will you know? Yes. So breaking you it down it. sometimes to say, here's one small thing. If Like, let's say your goal is to be um, to learn to rebuild trust with your spouse and you just say, I'm, I'm not going to check their phone at night to see who they texted because we have a system. Here's how yeah. they communicate with me. Yeah. Um, and that would be 
that's more specific and tangible, like, okay, we can work on this. Mm -hmm. So Jen, as you think about that commitment to change and these rhythms we're talking about, when is a good time or the best time for someone to make a commitment to change? And once you've made it for the week, should we ever tweak it or change it? Or if it's not going well, just wait for a new week to come and set a new commitment when the, the next week starts. Yeah, I've had a lot of people do that. And to me, that's more of a performance-based thinking, you know, like, check I it. failed this week, so I'll just, I'll just yeah. wait till next or, week, right, or, start over. Right, yeah, they just, they don't change it. And it's week after week yeah. after week, it's the same commitment to change, which is really yeah. just a um, a thought about changing, not really a commitment to changing, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> I yeah. like it, a thought about changing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Here's my thought about changing yeah. this week. Like, yeah. to think about changing. Right, exactly. <laughs> but if we're going to um, create new neural pathways mm -hmm. in our brain, right, um, we have to put something into place that yeah. we're willing to actually move towards. So um, otherwise, we're just slipping into behavior modification. Yeah. And that's why the faster skill double bind a commitment to change really work cohesively with one another um, because um, that awareness piece leads you to that deeper level of awareness. So yeah. thoughts and beliefs create emotions that drive behavior. So if my behavior is to look at my husband's phone, which by the way was actually my, re is what I consider my relapse when I'm looking at my husband's phone mm -hmm. or tempted to, to look at his emails. It's not that I hadn't had reason to in the past, but what that did for me, there was yeah. an element of pain shopping that I was yeah. experiencing. My heart would race. Pain shopping. That's pain, good. Yeah. Hmm. And, and there was, um, an element of control that I was experiencing in that moment. So for me, that, that was a huge piece of what I would consider a relapse for me. Um, but I have to work through my thoughts and beliefs that are dri driving that fear, that emotion, which um, pushed me towards having that behavior. Yeah. So using really all of these these tools that we've been talking about succinct, succ help succinctly, me. that's the word. Got it. Thank you. So um, using them together is really, really important. Yeah. It really, that's what rebuilds a new or what builds a new neural pathway. Yeah. Otherwise, behavior modification is only going to work for so long. Yeah. So we want something permanent and lasting. We want something with lasting results, which mm -hmm. means we need to take what we know to create lasting results and yeah. implement those into our lives. You guys already talked about how you made a change, where Nick asked a question about a commitment to change you had shared, and you're like, oh, no, we haven't done this. And then now you're already making those changes. Okay, now we need to think about daily, weekly. What are things that we can do? And I think that that's something that, um, we do in recovery anyway, where we start to use a tool, realize that we're not using it the right way and then tweak it or make this adjustment or ask someone, hey, help me adjust this or, or help me see this the right way. How has this been helpful for you? And so I think that those kind of things, a lot of us already do, but mm -hmm. we get into this mindset of performance based as we've already talked about. I have to get an A on this assignment in order to like, I have to do the thing that I said I'm going to do or I failed. Well, if the thing that you said you're going to do isn't realistic and no one on the face of the planet can do it, then it's okay to change it because this yeah. is not a grading system. You're not going to get to the end of that week and be like, okay, you got an A for recovery and that's going to make this huge difference. Sometimes no. things come up in the middle of the week too. Totally. Like I will have, totally. okay, this is what my commitment to change is going to be. And then life gives you a little bit of a detour and right. you're like, all right, I'm going to put that commitment yeah. to change on hold I because run this eight one miles takes priority. This week, but I'm throwing up and I can't do it. Right. Like, things happen exactly but then even smaller things like maybe something happened at work or something happened with group or whatever it may be can change but i think that we have to look at this this process of healing and recovery as dynamic it's always moving and changing and so for us are we moving and changing in the right direction or are we moving and changing in the wrong i think it could actually be changed from commitment to change to commitment to growth hmm. because growth That's does good. bring change ultimately yeah, so totally. i mean we're committing to growing There's more of that process mm -hmm. right yeah. You know, and I think if you're in a group, that's an obvious time to make your new commitment each week. Yep. In fact, I've I've mentioned this before, but encourage it because I see a lot of value that if if you'd like, take some time at the end of group and have people come up with their commitment to change then. Mm -hmm. Because yep. so often group is um, eye-opening. There's self-awareness. You hear someone else share, and you go, oh my goodness, I'm stuck yes. in the same thing. Yep. And there have been so many groups I've gone to like, ah, I, I kind of think this is what I'm working on this week. 
And then I'd share my faster scale. I'd go through group, and by the end, it's like, no, I there's mm-hmm. yep. yeah. totally something Start much over. more important that I need to focus yeah. on. Yeah. So I think that's a great rhythm to get in. Yep. If you're not in a group, the question might be just when is a good time for you to sit down and do some of this self-evaluation? Is it mm-hmm. uh, a quiet time when all the kids are gone? Is there a time in the evening or the morning where you're able to, to reflect and maybe walk through your faster scale, yep. identify what's been driving you, what emotions are you feeling, and then kind of look at that holistically and say, okay, in light of where I've been in the last week, where do I want to go in the coming week and set that new commitment? And Mm -hmm. I I think it could happen any time of the week. It's just the question, what is your rhythm? What makes sense for you? So that it does become, as we've talked about, just that regular part of your your habits and rhythms, Mm -hmm. almost like second nature, muscle memory, like you said, Jen, Mm -hmm. that this is just what I do to analyze my week and make make a plan for the coming week. Yeah. So... In the situation of being a betrayed spouse, having betrayal trauma as a part of your life, a commitment to change and facing your double binds is going to help you. Doesn't mean it's going to solve all your problems, doesn't mean it's going to restore your relationship overnight or in a month or in a week, whatever, but it is going to give you the tools, it is going to give you the mindset, it's going to give you the the practical steps in order to get to that next level or mm-hmm. layer of health that you want to get to. And mm-hmm. so even though these tools may seem like they're more for someone who's struggling or addicted, these are tools that we have intentionally in both struggling resources and betrayal resources because they're helpful. Um, and again, we are after, we, t- we talk about this a lot, this family systems issue, we're after holistic healing of the entire family, of the entire marriage of both spouses. And so these tools are really helpful and they're gonna be difficult. <laughs> it's not gonna be a fun experience, but change and growth is not always fun. Um, and it's not something that as you're doing it, you're like, yay, I'm growing. It's later, you're gonna look back and say, I'm so thankful that I implemented these tools in my life yeah. because look at where I'm at now. Yeah. So just be thinking about that future as you step into these. Jen, thanks for sharing your experience. Thanks for sharing about Dan. You know, he, we could have had him <laughs> in, come and talk about it, but just thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. And wherever you're at on your journey, Pure Desire is here to help create a roadmap for your healing. If you or someone you know is looking for help, go to puredesire.org and start your healing journey today. If you haven't subscribed to the podcast, do it. If you're already subscribed, write a review. It helps others find the podcast. And lastly, never stop being healthy.